Hi there everyone, it's Christy. I recently made a video about what Carl Benjamin, also known as Sargon of Akkad, doesn't know about toxic masculinity. The anger from people who want to deny that there are masculine norms and values in our society that result in negative outcomes is about as intense as when I used to present evidence to creationists that evolutionary theory is observable in the outcomes of nature. A recent article presents yet more evidence that certain aspects of Western notions of what it means to be a man and masculine result in negative outcomes for men and women. The authors of the research I'm going to cite themselves write, our meta-analyses demonstrate that three specific dimensions were significantly, robustly, consistently, and unfavorably associated with negative mental health, positive mental health, and psychological help seeking, self-reliance, playboy, and power over women. The masculine norms of playboy and power over women are the norms most closely associated with sexist attitudes, although the masculine norm of playboy can apply to both heterosexuals and sexual minorities. The robust and unfavorable association between conformity to these two norms and mental health-related outcomes underscores the idea that sexism is not merely a social injustice, but also has deleterious mental health-related consequences for those who embrace such attitudes. For instance, heterosexual men who adhere strongly to norms associated with sexism might struggle in their relationships with women, leading to poor mental health. I'm just going to end the quote there so you know that it's not the authors talking anymore, it's me. Look, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So here is a challenge for those who doubt these findings. Go and read the article I will present in this video for yourself, and try to respond to it with counter evidence from published studies if you can. Just because you don't like the results of a study, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Skeptics are to be led by the evidence, right? So here's the evidence. I'm going to present it in two sections. The first is a layman section where I'll cover a news story about the article, and then secondly, I will break down the article itself. Now that section is going to be a bit harder and a bit denser and use a lot of academic ideas, but if you are going to criticize the study, then you have to actually engage with the study, not just the media coverage reporting on it. And if you want to do a video response to me on this topic, again, you're not going to be responding to me. You're going to have to respond to the study. So if you want to criticize it, first you have to engage with it. Okay, are we ready for part one? Let's go. The authors of the study gave an interview to Popular Science, and the article reads, In the last three decades, social scientists and the broader public have examined the concept of toxic masculinity, focusing on traditionally male attributes that many have come to see as harmful not only to women, but also to men and the fabric of society. Scholars have not necessarily sought to demonize men or maleness, but to highlight the ways in which conforming to traditional masculine qualities like dominance, self-reliance, and competitiveness could be harmful to men and the people around them. It would be remiss to approach this topic without recognizing the reality that, to many people, these qualities simply encompass what it means to be a man. Many believe that these traits are biologically ingrained and critical for the evolutionary success of our species. It's not hard to see the appeal of being self-reliant, for example, being strong enough to best life's challenges without assistance. But putting too much stock in self-reliance could also make it hard for a man to reach out for help in times of crisis or difficulty, as this research suggests. It can have a negative effect on men's mental health, especially if they think that any other course of action would emasculate them. In such a scenario, suffering in silence may appear to be the only acceptable option. Wong, one of the article's authors, says attitudes like this capture what's so problematic about these masculine norms. People may assume that they'll be looked down upon if they break out of this pattern of behavior, even if that's not actually true. But it doesn't have to be this way. In our increasingly connected world, in which people have access to so many ideas beyond what they might have been exposed to in the past, there are more opportunities than ever to expand one's cultural consciousness. And indeed, this research is not the first or last word on the concept of toxic masculinity. 
Many others have written on it and will no doubt continue to do so. And just because these harmful norms will probably continue to be passed on, that doesn't mean they're unavoidable. Wong says that being a man is not some sort of essential quality and that ideas about what it means to be a man have changed throughout history. Masculine identity can even evolve for an individual over the course of his lifetime. Moving on now to the journal article, let's dig into their research and look at their findings. The title of the paper is Meta-Analyses of the Relationship Between Conformity to Masculine Norms and Mental Health-Related Outcomes, and it's authored by Wong, Ho, Wang, and Miller. Not the kind of typical feminist straw men that people on YouTube like to make fun of. The article starts with an introduction slash literature review. The purpose of this section in an academic paper is to set the stage for the reader. Here the authors will present information on previous research and findings on the topic, and then over the course of it identify a gap in the literature that needs to be addressed. The rest of the paper will then go on to make an original contribution to fill the gap in understanding identified in the introduction slash literature review section. The authors write, there has been growing recognition over the past decade that the relationship between masculinity-related constructs and mental health-related outcomes is probably more nuanced and may depend on the manner in which masculinity is operationalized, the specific dimensions of masculinity, types of outcomes, and the types of populations being studied. The gender role norms model, which focuses on individuals' conformity to dominant masculine norms in society, might provide an ideal forum for studying the differential effects of masculinities on mental health-related outcomes. Grounded in the psychology of social norms, Mahalik et al. defined conformity to masculine norms as, quote, meeting societal expectations of what constitutes masculinity in one's public or private life. Unquote, page three. Unlike other conceptual paradigms that focus on the negative consequences associated with masculinities, the gender role norms model proposes that conformity to masculine norms can be beneficial or problematic depending on different contexts. Hence, the theoretical basis of this model aligns well with the notion that masculinities may have differential relationships with mental health related outcomes. Further, the Conformity to Masculine Norms Inventory 94, CMNI 94, which was developed to measure individuals' adherence to masculine norms, encompasses 11 subscales, corresponding to 11 distinct dimensions of masculine norms, winning, emotional control, risk-taking, violence, dominance, playboy, self-reliance, primacy of work, power over women, disdain for homosexuals, and pursuit of status. Several factor analytic studies have provided support for the hypothesized factor structure of the CMNI-94 that corresponds to its subscales. The sheer number of subscales makes this measure an ideal assessment tool to address differential effects of conformity to masculine norms on mental health-related outcomes. It is therefore entirely conceivable that conformity to some masculine norms might be associated with psychological distress, whereas conformity to other norms might not. Wong, Owen, and Shea proposed two conceptual perspectives that explain how conformity to masculine norms might be differentially related to other outcomes. The variable-centered perspective, hereafter known as the predictor-centered perspective, proposes that the relationship between men's conformity to masculine norms and other outcomes varies as a function of the type of masculine norms. Conformity to some masculine norms may be maladaptive, whereas conformity to other norms are adaptive. In contrast, the person-centered perspective suggests that the consequences of conformity to masculine norms differ for diverse groups of individuals because of cultural and gender differences, Diverse groups of individuals may experience varying levels of rewards and sanctions associated with conformity and nonconformity to masculine norms. This perspective also dovetails with recent advances in intersectionality scholarship as applied to men of color. Accordingly, the person-centered perspective predicts that conformity to masculine norms will be differentially related to mental health-related outcomes depending on the culture of the individuals. In addition to the predicted, centered, and person-centered perspectives, a third perspective that was not considered in a previous study is the possibility that the link between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes 
varies as a function of the type of outcome. We label this perspective the outcome-centered perspective. These findings potentially suggest that conformity to masculine norms might be more strongly associated with interpersonal than with intrapersonal dimensions of mental health. Additionally, it is not possible to draw definitive conclusions from one study on the link between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes. Therefore, what is needed, and perhaps overdue, is a systematic statistical synthesis of findings on this topic. Against this backdrop, we sought to conduct a series of meta-analyses on the relationships between conformity to masculine norms as measured by the CMNI and mental health-related outcomes. There are several advantages afforded by the use of meta-analysis in analyzing masculinity-related constructs. First, meta-analysis allows researchers to amalgamate findings from a large body of studies using a common metric, thus increasing statistical power as well as the confidence with which researchers can draw conclusions about the relations between masculinity-related constructs and mental health-related outcomes. Second, although a recent book chapter provided a narrative review of research on conformity to masculine norms, a meta-analysis provides a more systematic process for aggregating research that focuses on the magnitude of effect sizes rather than on simply counting the number of studies with significant findings. Third, given the aforementioned mixed findings on the CMNI, meta-analyses would enable researchers to identify moderators of the link between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes across a wide range of dimensions, outcomes, and demographic characteristics. We focused on the mental health-related outcomes in the study because they are the most widely studied topic in the psychology of men and masculinities and also have important practical implications for clinical practice and for individuals' well-being. To ensure that a broad spectrum of studies were included in our meta-analyses, we adopted Key's conceptualization of complete mental health, which does not equate the absence of mental illness with the presence of mental health. Key's also included psychological well-being, for instance self-esteem, and social well-being, for instance, social connectedness with others, under the conceptual rubric of mental health. In support of this conceptualization, a factor analysis of positive indicators of mental health, for instance, life satisfaction, psychological well-being, and social well-being, and indicators of mental illness, for instance, depressive symptoms, in a national study of U.S. adults identified a two-factor model reflecting the latent variables of positive mental health and mental illness. The authors go on to write, We had four main goals in the study. First, we estimated the direction and magnitude of the relationship between conformity to masculine norms and our three sets of mental health-related outcomes. Based on the broad empirical literature on masculinities and mental health, we expected conformity to masculine norms to be unfavorably associated with mental health and psychological help-seeking. Second, based on the outcome-centered perspective, we tested moderation effects of conformity to masculine norms using specific types of positive and negative mental health outcomes, for instance, depression, substance use, body image problems, etc. On the basis of the aforementioned findings of Mahalik et al., we hypothesized that conformity to masculine norms would be more strongly associated with negative social functioning and positive social well-being than with psychological dimensions of health. Third, guided by the person-centered perspective, we examined moderation effects of gender, race, age, and developmental characteristics, that is to say college student status, and sexual orientation that might modify the relations between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes. We hypothesize that the magnitude of the relationship between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes would be stronger for male samples than for female samples, because masculine norms are perceived by individuals to be more relevant and consequential for men than for women. Additionally, we predicted the effect sizes would be weaker as the proportion of sexual minority individuals in the samples increase. This hypothesis is premised on prior research showing a weaker direct link between conformity to masculine norms and attitudes towards seeking psychological help for gay men than for heterosexual men in a U.S. community sample of adults. Fourth, 
As recommended by the Predictor Center perspective, we tested the relationship between each of the 11 dimensions of conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes to identify potential differential effects as a function of the type of masculine norm. No directional hypotheses were provided given the aforementioned mixed evidence in the extant empirical literature and the lack of prior theory in this area of research. I won't read out their method section. I will summarize it instead because of copyright reasons and also for time. What they did obtain in their final data set was a set of 78 samples found in 74 studies and a combined sample size of 19,453 participants. When it came to coding the data, the first author created a coding manual based on the aforementioned theoretical conceptualizations of mental health-related outcomes, and the outcome variables were categorized as A, negative mental health, B, positive mental health, and C, psychological help-seeking. For negative mental health, by that they meant depression, psychological stress or distress, substance use, body image problems, or other negative social functioning. Positive mental health was measured by life satisfaction, self-esteem, and other indicators of psychological well-being. For psychological help seeking, they looked at attitudes towards seeking professional help. Again, the details about this are available in the paper, and if you have any questions, I would first advise you go and read that section before posting questions to me in the comment section. Thanks. The data were then coded by two people independently, and they report on the intercoder reliability. Uh, in this paper, it was, it was basically from moderate to perfect agreement, for those of you who understand correlation. The cap has ran from 0.74 to 0.98. They then describe their data analytic plan. I'm again going to skip that for time and copyright purposes, but you can read the section on your own. And the last section that I'm going to skip is going to be the preliminary analysis. And in the preliminary analysis, they assess the quality of their data for possible errors or other things that might be problematic before proceeding with their actual analysis. Now getting on to their main analysis, the outcome-centered perspective. We tested moderation effects of conformity to masculine norms based on specific types of positive and negative mental health outcomes. In support of our hypothesis, the link between conformity to masculine norms and negative social functioning was significantly stronger than that between conformity to masculine norms and negative psychological health. Person-centered perspective. To examine our third research question, on the person-centered perspective, we tested moderation effects based on gender, mean age, developmental characteristics, race, and sexual orientation. Meta-regression showed that the mean age, race, and sexual orientation did not significantly moderate the link between conformity to masculine norms and negative mental health, positive mental health, and psychological help-seeking. Predictor-Centered Perspective Our fourth research question, guided by the predictor-centered perspective, focused on specific dimensions of conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes. As shown in Table 2, overall, the specific dimensions of conformity to masculine norms were significantly and positively related to negative mental health, as well as significantly and inversely related to positive mental health and psychological help-seeking. Therefore, we proceeded with moderation analyses for these outcomes, as reflected in Table 5, nine dimensions of conformity to masculine norms were significantly and positively related to negative mental health, whereas two dimensions, primacy of work and disdain for homosexuals, were not significantly related to negative mental health. In contrast to negative mental health, only four of the 11 dimensions of conformity to masculine norms were significantly and inversely related to positive mental health emotional control, playboy, self-reliance, and power over women, whereas winning, violence, dominance, primacy of work, disdain for homosexuals, and pursuit of status did not exhibit significant effects. Interestingly, risk-taking was favorably and significantly associated with positive mental health. Similar to negative mental health, self-reliance exhibited the largest effect size in association with positive mental health. Overall, these findings provide strong support for the predictor-centered perspective, namely, the link between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes differed 
as a function of conformity to specific types of masculine norms. The next section in their paper is the discussion, and I'm going to do a reduced version of that again for time and copyright purposes. Our meta-analytic findings reveal that conformity to masculine norms was positively associated with negative mental health, as well as inversely related to positive mental health and psychological help-seeking. These findings support previous assertions on the deleterious consequences associated with masculinities. However, the small effect sizes for positive and negative mental health contrast with the medium effect sizes for psychological help seeking, suggesting that individuals' conformity to masculine norms had potentially a greater impact on psychological help seeking than on mental health. These findings underscore the importance of utilizing innovative strategies to improve the psychological help-seeking attitudes of individuals who conform strongly to masculine norms. And I'm, Christy's here, I'm just gonna step out of, the, out of my uh, reader voice now. This is the main point. There are attitudes about what it means to be a man in Western society that seems to be stopping men from getting help they need when they have psychological problems or mental health issues. That is the point of this article. The longer people deny toxic masculinity, the longer the problem itself will be denied, and men will continue to not get the help they need. So you have to ask yourself what's more important. Remaining attached to an ideological position that toxic masculinity is made up by feminists to make men feel bad, or to recognize this study and other data that points to a link between certain kinds of values of what it means to be a man and men not getting the psychological help and assistance and counseling that they need, and that they're going to suffer in silence, and it might end up leading to them, some people committing suicide. So you have to pick which is more important to you, the ideology or solving the problem. Because for me, solving the problem is way more important. Okay, back to the paper. Our meta-analyses demonstrated that three specific dimensions were significantly robustly, consistently, and unfavorably associated with negative mental health, positive mental health, and psychological help-seeking. Self-reliance, playboy, and power over women. The masculine norms of playboy and power over women are the norms most closely associated with sexist attitudes, although the masculine norm of playboy can apply to both heterosexuals and sexual minorities. The robust and unfavorable association between conformity to these two norms and mental health-related outcomes underscores the idea that sexism is not merely a social injustice, but also has deleterious mental health consequences for those who embrace such attitudes. For instance, heterosexual men who adhere strongly to norms associated with sexism might struggle in their relationships with women, leading to poorer mental health. The findings pertaining to two other dimensions, primacy of work and risk-taking, are in stark contrast to these results. Primacy of work was not significantly associated with any of the mental health-related outcomes. Perhaps this null finding reflects the complexity of work and implications for well-being. The authors then go on to discuss the limitations of their study and its implications. Just quickly on terms of the limitations, they can't generalize to other masculinity constructs and outcomes such as like health behavior, for instance, physical exercise. They notice that the studies are all from English language publications, that there are limitations of the methods they used. There's a lack of longitudinal data to do different types of technique that could tease out these relationships more. Their sample size consisted mostly of men from the United States, so that means the findings aren't necessarily generalizable to either women or to people outside of the outside of the United States. And also they did not have as much information as they could on sexual orientation, which reduced the number of studies that they could use for their moderation analysis. They conclude, we argue that it is not particularly meaningful to discuss individuals' conformity to masculine norms in a generic sense. Rather, it is more useful to focus on men's conformity to specific dimensions of masculine norms. In conclusion, they write, our meta-analyses of 78 samples and 19,453 participants provide greater breadth of coverage and depth of analysis on the relations between conformity to masculine norms and mental health-related outcomes 
than any previous single study or literature review on this topic. Overall, conformity to masculine norms was significantly and unfavorably associated with mental health and psychological help seeking. Nevertheless, the substantial degree of heterogeneity in the effect sizes for these relationships highlights the need to disaggregate the generic construct of masculine norms and focus instead on specific dimensions of conformity to masculine norms and their differential associations with other outcomes. Now, if you've done any meaningful research into toxic masculinity, then none of this is going to be a surprise to you. And the solution for this problem is not that difficult. It doesn't take millions of dollars or passing legislation. All it takes is for people to change their views of masculinity. Instead of telling boys to stop crying and be a man, teach them that emotions are a natural part of being a human and that it's okay to express them. Instead of talking to boys about women as if they were objects to be won and conquered and therefore men's sexual pleasure, teach that women are people who have the ability and right to not have sex with somebody that they don't want to. I mean, I could go down a long list here, but instead I will just point you to my video hangout where a few friends and I reviewed the documentary The Mask You Live In, which is devoted to showing the link between certain types of masculine norms that are harmful in our society and the way they result in harming boys and men. Feminists have been making this point for a long time. This meta-analysis is just more evidence that feminists and their critiques are talking about something real in the world and something that needs to be dealt with. People like Carl Benjamin make supposed jokes about this cause of men's mental health problems, and I'm sure his fans will defend him, but the sooner that people who claim to be skeptics, the sorts of people who base their views in evidence not propaganda or ideology, are actually led by the evidence, then the sooner we can all participate in creating a society with masculine norms that produce mentally healthy and happier men. That's going to wrap it up for me. Until next time, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention and watching all the way to the end of the video. I will be back with another video very soon. Bye.